Um, now we're moving to um, one of the highlights of today, which is our um, sample MBA lecture. Um, and joining us today is Professor Darren Dahl, the man to my, to my left. Um, Professor Dahl is one of our top professors here at the Solar School of Business. He's the Fred H. Siller Professor in Applied Marketing Research and the Associate Professor of Marketing. Um, he received his PhD in Marketing from the University of British Columbia and had a BCom in Accounting from the University of Alberta. His research interests focus on new product design and development, creativity, consumer product adoption, the role of social influence in consumer behavior, and understanding the role of self-conscious emotions in consumption. Um, his work is widely published um, in the Journal of Marketing Research, Journal of Marketing, Journal of Consumer Research, Management Science, and the Journal of Consumer Psychology. I can tell you from having spoken to a lot of the students who study on the MBA program that they love Darren and his, his classes are always oversubscribed. Um, so I'm really pleased that he's, um, he's able to join us today. No um, pressure. So now I'm going to pass you over to the man himself, uh, Professor Dahl. Thank you. Thank you. So it's, uh, it's really my pleasure to be here uh, today. They've asked me to, to give you a little bit of the taste of what it would be like uh, to be in the MBA program. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm going to try to, at least, break down a case analysis with you. Okay? And for those of you that don't know what a case analysis is, it's actually a type of learning that we do in the MBA program where we look at a real situation that happened a few years ago, and we try to understand some aspect of business by seeing what happened. Now, the big part of a case analysis is it's not just somebody up at the front lecturing. It's actually you guys doing most of the talking. And so that's what's going to happen. I'm going to play it just like we play it. And so that means I'll be asking you questions. So I may say to this man right here, what do you think? And he'll be like, bang, and he'll have an answer. And it'll be amazing, right? And we'll be like, oh, I want to sit by that guy, right? Because he's got game. But I may ask a question, boom, and you have no idea because you were just still thinking about lunch and how you wanted one of those other boxes and you made a bad choice, right? You got the bad sandwich, you should have got the other one. So you're not sure. So if that's the case, right, at least the way I play in my classes, you can look to the right, look to the left, check out who's looking better today, right? And then just throw them under the bus. And just say, you know what, she's going to take it today, okay? So if I ask you a question in the next 30, 45 minutes and you don't have a clue, it's okay to push it left, push it right, and see what they say. Now, if they don't know, it'll just continue to pass along until it gets to some of the administration on the side. Okay? Is that, is that fair game? All right. Now, my goal is, because I'm a marketing professor, to, to kind of leave you with a takeaway. And when we teach a case, that's really what it's about, is you listen, you learn, you engage, and you walk out of the room, right? And you, you got something you can hang on to. Because bottom line, when you do any of these education programs, right, MBA, BCom, anything at university, and most of you, of course, have a degree already, you don't remember everything that you learned. Hopefully you remember a few key takeaways, right? Each class that you take should give you something you put in the toolbox and you can use downstream. So today, I'm going to try to give you a takeaway, okay? So if nothing else, you walk out of today with something that you can put in the toolbox that you'll always remember. So the case today, okay? Now I, I want, to, want to get a general reaction today is the case that I chose is about this product and this product. Never heard of them. I don't believe that for a second. So this is an interesting and fascinating story. Okay? And this is a case put out by the Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School is one of the biggest case providers in the world. And they put out cases every year, hundreds of cases actually. And then we use them in our teaching throughout the world in all the different MBA programs. This is an interesting product. Why? What do you think? Ivan, sit on the front row. I love it. Um, people like sex. Okay. <laughs> this is a very bold class. <laughs> so Ivan says, this is an important product because people like sex. And I guess that's true, obviously. Why, why do we know that's true? How successful are these products? Any guesses? How much in the first three, four years did Viagra sell? How much money did Pfizer bring in? Because of this product. Any guesses? What do you got? Wasn't it in a single billion, like four billion, something like that? He's, he's even higher. You're, you're with him in the front row. But it, it was a billion dollars a year. Yeah. So if you look across the three, four years, a billion dollars every year for this product, Viagra, right? That's amazing. And so when Viagra came to market, though, 
right? It was a little scared. Why was it scared to bring this new product to market? Any ideas? It was a huge success, right? Billion dollars every year. Yay! Why were they scared, though? It's taboo. You mean sex is taboo? She's like, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It was a product coming to market that was a bit sensitive, right? And so if you're the marketer and you've got this great new product and you're like, oh, this is going to be a billion dollar product, right? But we got some fears because it's a taboo. People don't talk about it, right? What is it that we don't talk about? What does Viagra do? He's, he's like, I talk about it all the time. <laughs> not, not for you per se, right? Erectile dysfunction, absolutely. And, and we always, when I teach it in class, we don't like to say the word, so we just call it ED. It just seems safer, right? ED was the big problem, and people didn't talk about it. So what did Viagra do? Does anyone remember? It's 1998, right? And they're bringing this product to market. What did they do? How did they introduce it? Any guesses? Can you remember? <laughs> he's like, I totally remember. Okay, that was a viral commercial. That wasn't the real commercial. <laughs> but they did release some commercials, right? They did release some commercials. Who was the spokesperson? Didn't they get Rafael Palmero? Not at the beginning, but eventually, yes. And, and part of that was because of what they did in the beginning, they had to then move to a new spokesperson later. And we'll talk about that in a second. Any guesses on who? None of you remember. Was it Bob Dole? It was! Good job. Okay, so Bob Dole, right? He's our first spokesperson for Viagra, right? Why Bob, who is Bob, who is Bob Dole? For those that don't know in the studio audience, hmm? Who is this guy? He lost, yeah, he lost an election. <laughs> He's a loser. Okay, that's true, true. But in the American election, what, what party was he part of? Republicans, right? So he was a Republican, right? And what do we think about Republicans? And I'm not asking for a political statement, but just tell me, are Republicans conservative, right? Okay. So we've got this conservative thing going on, right? What are they always talking about besides conservative stuff? Religion, family values, right? And so why do you think that Viagra chose this guy? He, so number one, it's a good market to sell to. How old is this guy? <laughs> He's totally got ED, man. He's old. Fair. Okay, yeah. No, that was one of the big reasons, okay? So you guys are hitting on the reasons. Number one, he was old, right? 70s. And so here's a guy that clearly is probably someone that could use this product. What about this other side? Why did they choose a guy that was Republican and conservative? If he could talk about it, then really everybody Exactly, right? If a conservative Republican can talk about this, and you said taboo, right? this taboo product, then it's totally okay, right? We can bring it up at the dinner parties, me and my man right there. It's all good, ED, all day, right? And that's what they wanted to do, was use this guy as a spokesperson, right? So that it would legitimize the product. So that people wouldn't be like, oh my God, Viagra, I can't say that word, right? And what happened, you remember, the first couple, two, three years, was this a success? Would you give it the A grade? Or would you give it the, the F? Total A grade, huge success, right? It actually became kind of like Kleenex, right? Kind of like Electrolux. A product that we just associated, right? A little, what was the color of the pill? Blue. See, the fact that you all know that tells you <laughs> a few things. We're going to leave it there, right? <laughs> no, we all know that, right? We all know that because it became so common in our society. And that was, we have to give them the A. That was a brilliant move to use Bob Dole out of the gates, right? So what happen next? Did this, was this a good thing over time? For, for some perspective, because the first couple years it legitimized it, it, it wasn't taboo anymore, that was good, right? But after three or four years, Viagra as a product, right, Pfizer said, you know what? Great strategy to start with, but the problem is, what? What's the problem when you choose Bob Dole as your spokesperson? He's already quite old, yeah. There's a time limit on this dude, right? Sad to say, yeah, he was really old. And so what did people start to think, right, little hint here, about this product? It's for really old people, right? And if you're in your 50s and 60s and you've got that issue of ED, right, it's not for you. You've got to wait till you're 70. 
You gotta wait till you got that Bob Dole action and then the product works. What do you think? Actually, that's what consumers kind of thought, right? And so what did Viagra do? And someone gave me a little hint there. What was that hint? They brought in Rafael Perrin. Yeah, Rafael Perrin and, and younger athletes. They also went to NASCAR, right? NASCAR, not so big in Canada, very big in the U.S., right? Mark Martins, very famous driver, brought him in as well. They brought these guys in, right? Why do you think? We moved from Bob, right? Now it's 2002, Mark Martin, Paul Merrill, right? Why did we move to these guys? Yeah, younger, athletic, what else? Yeah, different target. Totally different target. So let's move, right, from these old to perhaps something a little more younger. But what about these guys? They're, yes, they're younger, so we're getting out of the 70s. We're hitting the 60s, 40s, 50s area. What, what about them? Are, who are these people? If I pick on you, Andro. More market. <laughs> I like that. Your voice is just like ventriloquist. <laughs> what is it? It's a, it's a what market? To totally true, totally true. I give you that. You got me. That's true. But, but what, what, what is, what is uh, underlying these dudes? Because you could pick any of us that are 40, right? I'm 40. Anyone else here under 40? You're with me. You're 40. Nice. We want to be them. Why? Well, they're physically strong. That's right. So welcome to the gun show. These guys have game, right? They're heroes, right? And so that's the idea is not only did they move from this Bob Dole conservative old, but now you've got people that are truly masculine, right? Because one of the arguments when you experience, honest I don't know, ED, right, is you lose masculinity. So you can say, look at these guys, these are heroes, these are men's men. That's what Viagra is. Great strategy, right? The sales continue to grow. So the case that I want to talk about with that big pregame is what do you do if you're Cialis? Cialis is a product that came onto the market in 2002, right? Received clearance from the FDA. Okay, go, right? And you're staring at Viagra, who owns the market, right? What do you do? You're the management team, right? And that's where the case sets up. Is you're parachuted in, you're facing this monster called Viagra, doing a billion sales a year, and it owns it. It's a synonym for solving the problem. So that's the question. And you kind of start thinking, I hope you're thinking, I don't know. <laughs> Tell us, what do you do, right? And this is where the marketing theory comes in, or what I would say is the big takeaway, right? And some of you have already poked at it a bit because you just know it or you work already in the industry or something, right? Often in marketing, we talk about positioning. And positioning is how you sit in the marketplace in the mind of the consumer. So where do they see you? So think about cars, right? If I said, well, there's a Toyota, right? There's a BMW, there's a Mercedes, right? There's a Ford. Instantly in your mind, you can put them in various slots in the marketplace. Do you know what I mean? You say, oh, that's luxury. Oh, that's good driving. Oh, wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot, you know? You think of that immediately. <laughs> and so when you think about Cialis and Viagra, the big question for sales is how do we position ourselves in the marketplace so that when consumers have a choice, they go to their doctor and they say, you know what, I want this or I want this, what do they think of when they think about sales? Do they think the same as Viagra or do they think something different? So what we do in marketing is we try to create a position in the marketplace that we can defend and that will enable us to be successful. And the little formula I want to tell you, this is the takeaway, right, is positioning simply equals a target segment plus differentiation. And I'm going to explain what this means in the rest of my 30 minutes, okay? Target market, target segment plus differentiation. When you use these two elements, it enables you to create a position in the marketplace. It focuses you. So that when you're Cialis, you don't just wander into the marketplace and totally get destroyed, okay? First half of it, target segment. What is segmentation? What does that mean? And a couple of you already threw some bombs at me because you already know what it is. What is it when we target a segment? What are we doing? Back in the Mad Men era, the 50s, right? Some of you watching that show, it's pretty tight. 
There was no such thing as segmentation. It was just mass marketing, right? We made soap, everybody bought it. It doesn't happen anymore, right? Now we have segmentation. So what does it mean? Oh, what these people are so participating. I love it. What is it? Loud and proud. You're focusing on a specific what? Demographic characteristic. Yeah, exactly. You choose who you want to buy your product. And, and sometimes you don't, there's some people you don't want to buy your product, right? Think about Burberry and some of these fashion brands. I don't know if you follow the news, but they're like actually paying some people on certain shows not to use their products. <laughs> Please don't use our products. In fact, use this coach bag instead. <laughs> That's called segmentation. <laughs> but that is a big part of marketing, right? And we have what we call the classic bases of segmentation. I'll make this a B. Classic basis. And someone yelled one of them out, right? How we divide up a marketplace. There's typically four that we think about. What's one way that we can divide up people into different groups? Demographics. Demographics. And age isn't a good example. And that's the most common use base of segmentation. Why? Why is age so common? This man here. What do you well, think? It's very unambiguous. You guys are so good. Unambiguous, exactly. It's pretty easy to say woman, man, <laughs> old, young. Right? It works. That's why we often see demographics as our first base, right? Demographic. Second base, right? I would say that's also quite common, we call geographic. Right? Because people in different areas of the world, the country, BC, they have different consumption behaviors. One of my favorite examples is uh, actually in Atlanta. Have any of you been to Atlanta? A couple of you. There's a big museum there by a company. Do you know what museum? Yeah, I love that museum. Why? Because the last room, have any of you been to the Coke Museum? The last room has all these fountains of pop. 50 fountains and you get this free glass and you just get to try all the pop and if you have kids they just get like this huge sugar rush and they bounce off the walls, it's awesome, right? So I was in there and I'm trying all the different Coke products. And what's amazing is they taste totally different depending on the geographic, which makes sense, right? How many of you have traveled around the world and you eat pizza, right? Pizza in Japan, very different than pizza in Italy, very different than pizza in Hong Kong, very different than pizza in North America. That's a geographic segmentation. Third one, psychographic. Has anyone heard of this one before? So if your third base is psychographic, what's that a base of? Moral values. Good. Moral values. Anyone want to expand on that? I mean, that's part of it. What's that? Who you think you are, lifestyle. It's often called lifestyle, to, to bring that together. Often called lifestyle segmentation. And I like to think about it in high school, right? Remember way back when, when you were in high school, right? There was just different herds, different groups. The jocks were over here, the nerds were over here. We had stoners where I grew up, they were over there, right? And everyone had a group and they all had a very specific lifestyle. And we can see marketers use that today, right? One of my favorite Super Bowl ads, about eight, nine years old now, was... Uh, a guy on a bike chasing this cheetah. Do any of you remember that one? And the cheetah's going, and the guy on the bike's chasing him, and he finally catches him, jumps off and tackles the cheetah. And then he puts his hand down the cheetah's mouth. Do you remember that? And then pulls out a Mountain Dew can. He's like, bad kitty. And all his buddies are like, yeah, that's why I'm not a cat person. Right? Remember that ad? You don't. Okay. <laughs> but what type of psychographic marketing was Mountain Dew doing there? Who, what kind of lifestyle cluster were they going after? Extreme sports. Yeah, extreme sports, exactly. Hugely successful, right? They launched sequel products, Mountain Dew Code Red, based on the success of that psychographic segmentation system. Cool. Last one is behavioral. This is the hardest one to actually use, but it's often the most successful. Okay? So what would it mean by behavioral segmentation? Yeah, so if you use if you use an adoption curve, right? When do people start buying the products, right? So if you like like a book like Crossing the Chasm and you've looked at that type of stuff. That's behavioral segmentation. Looking at how people buy your product. And, and to use that example, right? We all have friends that like they have to have the latest edition of the iPhone. Like they're standing in line. And they're there, right? Whereas some people, you know, they're still working their way up to a black and white TV, right? They're just slow, right? And so that's a behavioral way to segment. There's lots of ways that we behavioral segment. How people use a product. So think of Arm & Hammer baking soda, right? Some people use it to clean their carpets. Some people put it in their fridge. Some people even bake with it, right? Different ways that people use it. So these are the four classic bases, right, of segmentation. How does that apply to ED? 
how could we segment, right? If you're sitting there, you're in the Cialis border, and you're thinking to yourself, how are we going to divide this market? What are some obvious ones? What do you guys think? So there's one right there, right? Let's go after the women. So let's segment on a demographic variable, which is gender. And that's one thing the company considered. Let's think about maybe we should go after the women instead of the men. Possible. And they did consider that. Okay? What's another way they could do it? Guesses. What do you got? Uh, make it a little more even and make it last longer. Make it more even and make it last longer. How would that fit in those four bases if I push back a little on you? Again, we're looking at how people use it. Somebody who takes less risks. Okay. So, so maybe look at a psychographic people that are willing to take less risks. So look for, for people that are more conservative. Because that's true. One of the big problems uh, Viagra had at the beginning was they had this very big health scare, right? There's a lot of heart problems. People died, right? This is bad. <laughs> And so maybe you could try to do psychographic profiling and say, let's go after people that are very scared of risk. It's not bad. Any other things that come to mind? Recreational use versus medical. Okay. They, they actually did talk about that because it's true that some people use these products for more recreational uses versus more medical uses. That often skews with age, which, <laughs> truthfully, which is another way that, that it was thought about, right? Is that Viagra had much of the older demographic but maybe Cialis should go after a younger demographic, right? The last one that I'll mention... Oh, go ahead. I mentioned people that want to be more discreet about Okay, so that, and that's a behavioral one, right? So perhaps we could think about segmenting people according to, you know, there are people that would like to buy it, let's say, on, through the mail, right? Or through online ordering. Have UPS deliver the little box versus going to the store, perhaps. Totally. Another behavior. The last one that was often used, and the company did use, was they thought about, well, let's think about people that have tried the product versus have not tried the product versus people that have tried it and remain loyal to Viagra versus people that have tried it and not remain loyal to Viagra. And so they thought maybe that's a way we could segment it. And in that segmentation system, you can think about it. You know, can you imagine who is the bigger market, right? The biggest market is people that haven't tried it. But in the end, they decided to go after the people that had tried Viagra and had stopped using it. Right? Because they thought that these people had some experience, but weren't satisfied. And so that's part of the segmentation system that they use. So hopefully you can see some of the differences as you try to figure out where and in which segment you want to go after. Second part of the equation, differentiation. And we'll come back to this when we wind up. But differentiation, what does this mean? What's that? What's the advantage one to another? Very nice, right? When you go into the marketplace, you have to try to figure out how are you different? What do we have that's different, right, than other programs here in MBA land? Do you don't think we think about that? Of course we do, right? What is different about solder than, let's say, doing an MBA at SFU or at Athabasca online, right? What are the points of differentiation? So whenever you're thinking about business, in this case, Cialis versus Viagra, they had to ask, how are we different? And there's lots of, just like here, bases of segmentation, there's bases of differentiation, right? So if I name, and I'll just name a couple because there's more, right? But one is product or brand differentiation, right? One is, I think you guys are good, price, yeah? We can put price up there, let's put price up there. I was going to say service, right? Maybe number four would be image. Right? You can think of lots of ways that you can actually differentiate. I like product and brand because you see that every day. Right? When you go get gas at Chevron, right? what does Chevron have in its gas? Techron. What is Techron? A few people know. Yeah, a few know. <laughs> Most of us don't know, but I'm like, yeah, I always think I've got to get some Techron because it just seems good. Right? And I have presented this before and someone one of the engineers in the crowd is like, I can actually tell you exactly what Techron is. He walked up to the board, he wanted to go at it. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> just an example. <laughs> but you can think of lots of these types of products that do this, right? What's a Digitech 4 processor? Well, Canon cameras have them in it, and they talk about it all the time. I have no idea what it is, but I like to say Digitech 4 processor. It just, I can't quite say it, so it sounds cool, right? Weston has what? 
And we stayed in a Weston recently. <laughs> they do have rewards. <laughs> Very nice. What do they have? Exactly, the heavenly bed. There's a differentiator, right? And I love that heavenly bed because it's so white and so much. She's nodding, she knows. The big white pillows, right? And you get in there and you bounce on it. Woo, heavenly bed. Super successful for the company, right? It's a differentiator that makes people think, you know, hey, I've got to buy my gas at Chevron. I should stay at Weston because they've got the heavenly beds. Everybody's got beds, by the way, but they've got the heavenly bed, right? It's all differentiation. Second one, price. Obviously, we know that one. It's a Walmart world, right? Versus Holt Renfrew. You can differentiate on price, totally. Service. Stay at a Ritz-Carlton. Stay at a Marriott Courtyard. Same company. You may not know that, but same company, right? Differentiated by service. Last one, image differentiation. What does that mean? How people perceive the product. How people perceive the product, yeah. Remember when you were younger, right? Back in the 70s is when I was younger. I, I love this movie, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Anyone see that one? Yeah, so awesome, right? And Spicoli, who was Spicoli? Sean Penn. He was Sean, totally Sean Penn. Yeah, I liked him because he was like the, the slacker dude and he used to wear what shoes? Does anyone remember? Uh, Vans checkerboards. Nice, Vans checkerboards, right? He's like, she knows her movies. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And I remember in the movie, right, that he had these vans and he hit his head with them. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. When you're young, you think things are cool, right? And I thought, oh, I've got to get me a pair of vans, right? And so I did. All through, like, junior high and high school, I wore these vans. And I'm like, yeah, I've got this crazy rebel image, right? Well, the years go by. And, you know, you hit your midlife crisis thing. And you're like, you know what? I need a pair of vans again, right? So I was down doing the shopping trip right down to Bellingham there. And stopped in one of that Vans outlet stores. And I thought, I'm going to get me a pair of Vans. And I walk in, right? And I go over and you see the big wall of Vans. And you're like, oh, yeah, checkerboard, yeah. So you go up to it and I'm looking at it. And then I hear these two young guys behind the sales counter, right? The sales clerks. And they're like, hey, look at that old guy over there. And I'm like, where's, where's the old guy? <laughs> I'm like, crap. So I had to slink out of the store without my Vans. How has Vans been able to do this image differentiation? Any guesses? How have they stayed fairly, you can argue that, fairly young for 40 years? Skateboarders. Skateboarders, yeah. They sponsor the Van Warp Tour, which brings alternative music acts out. They do everything they can with their marketing dollar, right, to continue to create the idea that they're a rebellious brand that's been around as long as old guys like me. Differentiation. So when we talk about Cialis, right, does anyone know how they were differentiated? What they were different than Viagra? There was three big things. I actually also want to ask a question. Sure. Here and there, would you separate the fact that it's a different chemical? Like it's an actually a possibly different, is that a product brand or is it something else? It would fall here, right? And if it was something that was relevant to the consumer, see, because often we make the mistake as, as scientists, engineers, whatever, that we see a difference in the chemical but if the consumer at the end doesn't see a difference, who's right? Sadly, the consumer, right? And because it was a different chemical, it, it, it provided different benefits, actually. And that, and that is what leads to the differentiation that ended up mattering. So it's a great question. But it would fall here in terms of the ingredients, right? And you can think of companies that have used that, right? Think about Intel, right? Intel inside, brilliant. Nobody even knows exactly what Intel does, but it's got Intel inside. Well, that's awesome. Right? Let's get that Intel chip, and I have no idea what it does. But as a consumer, they were very successful on what we call ingredient, or what you're talking about, branding. Yeah, great example. Anyone know? Any guesses on how Cialis was different? Maybe for like the average guy, just compared, compared to Rafael Palmeiro. Like yeah, I mean, they could have made that choice, and you'll see what they did. They didn't actually position it towards, in the end, the average guy. What they did is they focused on things, and I, it was like a quiz. I'm not sure anyone would get it. But a big difference okay, on Cialis was how long it would actually work. So Viagra, you had a four-hour window. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming nobody knows that, right? But you've got four hours. You take the pill, you've got four hours. Go, right? <laughs> That's Viagra. No, it's true. That's what it is, right? But Cialis was different because it gave you a 36-hour window. Okay, and that's because, and that goes to your question, right? That goes because of the ingredient, the chemical. Okay? So that was one big point of differentiation. And all of you are like, that's a good one. 
totally, right? A second one was that it didn't react with food. Okay? Because Viagra had some problems that would re react with specific types of foods and make your tummy hurt, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> you don't really want to get it on in the four hours. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that was kind of an issue. So this was good, too. And the third one, actually, is health and safety. There was a few benefits as well. Right? And I think someone actually mentioned that a little bit earlier. Right? Is that, you know, that was a concern for a lot of people for Viagra. And so if you put now our formula together, right, what do you have? You've got a target segment, and remember, they thought about behavioral segmentation on who had tried Viagra, who hadn't. They had thought about demographics, age, gender. You guys identified that very nicely, right? You've got that part of the equation, plus you've got the ways that you're different. So now how do you want to build your marketing program, do you think? This becomes the big question. You've got these two pieces. What do you market on? Exactly. Totally. Totally. And, and you could do it on all three, but most companies don't. Why do we only really, marketers will argue, you can argue back, that you should really only market on one thing. Why do you think that is? People have short attention spans. It's confusing. Totally true. Right? When you were little, did you ever play that game with your sister or brother where you kind of sit on them and then you go like this on their forehead and you're like, name 10 chocolate bars, right? And nobody can ever name 10, right? Because you really can only remember a few things. And so we think about that in marketing because we call it actually a unique selling proposition, right? Really focus on one thing. So when I say Volvo, what do you think? Wow, works, eh? Pretty cool. When you think of McDonald's, what do you think? <laughs> I just had to throw that out there. <laughs> okay? But that's what we often talk about. And so if you had to pick one of these three, which would have you picked, guys? What do you think? What's that? You say the first one. So a lot of votes for the first one, okay? What about the second one? Anybody going to champion that? It was like, no. No. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, they thought that was the weakest point of difference. They couldn't really own that. What about the third one? Improve safety. So some of you say yes to that one. And that was the struggle, as you guys guess, right? But in the end, they didn't go with this one. Why? They've already said that they're willing to try it. Exactly. People are, have already tried it. They're already willing to try it. That was part of it. That's half of it. And the other half was they didn't want to highlight anything to do with dying. <laughs> no, it's true, right? It's like... Exactly. And so that's what they decided. Though it was still part of it, right? If you looked and read about the two products, you would learn about that. But when you're building your commercial, right, you don't put a big skull and say, Viagra skull, us. Less of a skull, right? <laughs> Didn't work. So this is what they went with. Now what's interesting, or I'll argue what's interesting, okay, is that you could just take that point of differentiation and mark it on it, right? And you could say what? <laughs> and we have someone making taglines. <laughs> yeah, you could say, guess what? Super Viagra. That's what we are. And that's what we would call a very simple position, right? Or you could say, it's ready when you are. It's ready when you, lots of taglines <laughs> coming, right? It's ready when you are, sure, right? You can do it more, right? You can do it cheaper. You could actually go for the price crowd on that, right? Lots of different direct, blunt ways to use this point of differentiation. The trick often is, though, the formula, right? Target segment. When you add the target segment that they were interested in to the point of differentiation, then you get what I would call a more mature position. And so they decided, whoever said females, okay, not to target to females. In fact, Levitra, which was the third competitor, targeted females directly. What they did was target something different. What did they target? Couples. Couples. Yeah. They said, look, Viagra owns the male hero. They've been pounding that for years, right? It's great. That was not a joke. Stop it. You guys are terrible. <laughs> Bad class. <laughs> they said what we can do is we can use this point of differentiation, P, 
people that were dissatisfied, right, that behavioral segmentation. And think about couples. Think about the male and the female. So what does that mean then as a position in the marketplace? When you add those two elements together, any guesses? And you kind of have the tagline. You know who you're speaking to. Exactly. And if you're a couple, if you're marketing, marketing to a, an older couple, right, that has an ED problem, what are you giving them back? <laughs> Time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but what else are you giving them back? You, options. Okay, you guys are all very function, sex appeal. Okay. Yes, romance. Oh, romance, yes. <laughs> and now you have a position in the marketplace. You've got Viagra who's selling get your manhood, your hero back. But now we have Cialis enters the market targeting couples, targeting people that have tried Viagra before and have been dissatisfied. What do we give you? We give you romance. You don't have to run to the bedroom because you've only got a four hour window. You got 36 hours. You can go mow the lawn. You can do stuff. And then when the romantic moment hits, awesome. Right? That's the positioning. And what I've tried to tell you, and I'll give you one more example from a different industry, right? Is when you think about these two things, this notion of choosing a specific audience and figuring out what you have that you can offer that's different. Then you have something compelling, and you give what we call you know, a reason for the consumer to buy your product. It fills a need, which is what really marketing is. is not making needs, but trying to fill needs that people have. People that have lost romance in their relationships. Does that make sense? I'll shift with one other quick example, because I've got four minutes that I love always to share, to quiz you with, to see if you can take away what we've talked about. Fast food. I hinted at McDonald's. Right? Let's break down the formula. Who's the target segment of McDonald's? Who isn't? And that's, that's fair at some level, right? It, it, definitely if you were to think of fast food, right? The most mass market fast food is probably McDonald's. But overall, if, you, if I push you to, to focus in, who would you say that they own? Families. Families. Yeah, busy. F yeah, you could frame it different ways. If we did it uh, demographically, families, right? Families, and just a fun, easy, convenient food source. Point of differentiation. So think about here in town. Who else do we have? A and W. This is a more interesting one. Who is the target segment of A and W? If you, oh, someone nailed it. Who is it? Baby boomers. Baby boomers. And you read their annual report, right? It's baby boomers, older people. In fact, if you talk to the, the CEO, who's our faculty advisory board chair here at Sauter, Paul Hollins, and you ask him, he would tell you, baby boomers. So it's starting to change. And often when he does presentations to the MBAs or to the undergrad students here, um, you know, he talks about his company, and then lots of people put up their hand like, aren't the baby boomers going to die soon? <laughs> no. <laughs> but obviously in the last few years, you started to see their commercials, as an example, right, start to migrate. But for years... They were targeting baby boomers. And Paul has said, right, I'll never build a ballroom in one of my restaurants. Have you ever seen a ballroom or a playground in A&W? No. That's not their target segment. They go after baby boomers. So what's their point of differentiation? How do they try to be a little bit different? Quality. Quality is part of it. And he would say that, and they do have data that shows, you know, in terms of tastes of burgers, you know, they rate quite high compared to the other options. Nostalgia. Decor. Nostalgia. Decor. Yeah. They brought back the burger family. Remember? The, I love the burger family, right? They, they have a history. And they have a history. And when you go into their restaurants, right, if you're a baby boomer, sadly, here, right, it brings back memories. I grew up in Edmonton, right, and I always drive with my family to Calgary, and there's this little place in the middle. What's it called? Red Deer. Yeah, <laughs> Red Deer. And at the end of Red Deer was this little drive-in, right, A&W, and you drive your car in, right, park it. And they'd come out and they'd bring out the burgers and the frosty thing. And I was just like four. And I'd be like, yeah, the frosty mug. And you, you love that, right? And so it works on me. Whenever I go buy an a and I'm like, oh, frosty mug. Right? Nostalgia. It's a way that that company okay, targets someone and then uses differentiation to be different than McDonald's, to be different than Wendy's, to be different than Burger King, so that you have a reason to go there. 
think about their commercials, right? That classic one where they're in the car, maybe some of you have seen it, and they drive up and the guy honks the horn and the wife's like, they don't do that anymore, and boom, they come out and do that again. Nostalgia. What about Burger King? <laughs> Burger King has struggled a bit for a number of years. Uh, they were targeting more the teenagers. If you remember the King, the King promos and the King commercials, right? They had subservient chicken as their viral website, which probably none of you went to, but it was really big for 14 and 15 year olds because you could type in something and then the chicken would do it. You did it, didn't you? <laughs> it's like I love that, right? That's who they targeted. And in almost any industry, because I'll leave it there, right? You can use this formula to think about who are they going after? How are they different? And that creates a position in the marketplace. Okay? Thanks for hanging. I'm going to turn the time back to our...